and good evening. It's February 2nd, 2024. Welcome to another one of our Branches on the Vine with the Bible Project and the Sermon on the Mount series. So the Bible Project, they created this series to cover the entire year, right? Every five weeks, approximately. It started January 1st, the last sometime in late November. We're going to take some time to discuss each of these videos and other creative topics as they are presented. The videos that we're going to be discussing, they're just the tip of the iceberg, as it were. They're, they're part of a learning series that I highly recommend, and they all can be found on the Bible Project app. Link to that is in the description below. So, welcome this evening to an episode of a chiastic conversation on the Sermon on the Mount on the Dusty Feet. And of course, before we forget, you find these kinds of podcasts useful, that's when you click the subscribe button. The reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, that's when you click that like button. Because that is the way that YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. So, this sermon, again, is found in Matthew 5-7. through And for me, it's the seminal moment in the teachings of Jesus. This is his longest, deepest, widest teaching that we have recorded in Scripture. And it covers things that we, probably, like to talk about, right? Yet deep down, we really have challenges living. So, let's take a look at this video and see where it takes us. Enjoy. The Gospel of Matthew is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus of Nazareth. And in chapters 5 through 7, we find a collection of Jesus' most well-known teachings, often called the Sermon on the Mount. Here we learn what Jesus means when he announces that the kingdom of the skies has come near and what it looks like to participate in God's kingdom. The whole sermon has been given a three-part shape. There's the introduction, then the large main body, and then the conclusion. The introduction announces the surprising, counterintuitive identity of those who are part of God's kingdom. Then comes the main body of teaching where Jesus explores what he means when he calls his followers to be righteous. What does he mean by righteousness? Righteousness is about living in right relationship with God and with others. It's a character trait that creates justice and peace in the world. And the body of the sermon is like Jesus' manifesto on righteousness, examined from three angles and three big parts. How this righteousness relates to the Torah, how this righteousness relates to religious practices of his day, and how this righteousness is expressed in our relationships with God and with neighbor. Finally, Jesus concludes the sermon by calling people to make a choice about how they're going to respond. Okay, I see it. Three main parts of this whole sermon, and the middle part itself has three parts. Right. And then every one of these parts itself has three parts. There is a lot of design in the structure of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to go over all of it. In the introduction, Jesus offers a surprise announcement to the people standing in front of him. They are invited to experience the good life of God's kingdom. He first offers nine sayings that redefine who is experiencing the good life, commonly called the Beatitudes. Here, we learn that those entering God's kingdom first are the lowly outsiders who hunger for righteousness and suffer as peacemakers. Next, Jesus calls his followers salt of the land. What's this all about? In the Hebrew scriptures, salt is a symbol of God's long-lasting covenant relationship with Israel. So Jesus is claiming that he and his followers are carrying Israel's covenant relationship to its fulfillment. Next, Jesus calls them the light of the world and a city set up on a mountain. Jesus is referencing here a promise from the prophet Isaiah that one day the inhabitants of Jerusalem would reflect God's light and peace and blessing out to all the world. So Jesus is saying that he and his followers are fulfilling that promise. Right. And how they go about doing that is what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Now, in the main body of the sermon, Jesus calls his followers to do righteousness. Righteousness means living in right relationship with God and with others. And Jesus explores his vision of righteousness from three perspectives, resulting in three big parts to the main body of the sermon. The first perspective, 
is that his teachings about righteousness fulfill the Torah and prophets. What does this mean? Well, the Torah and prophets refer to the Hebrew scriptures. And this big idea that Jesus fulfills them, it's unpacked in three parts. First, Jesus claims that he's not setting aside the laws of the Torah. Rather, he's bringing Israel's story and all of its laws to their completion. Next, Jesus offers six case studies of how his righteousness fulfills the Torah. He explores the topics of anger, lust, divorce, telling the truth, revenge, and enemy love. Finally, Jesus sums up this way of life as teleos, a Greek word that means complete or whole. The purpose of the Torah is to teach people God's wisdom so they can become mature, whole people who spread God's blessing to the world. And this call to become whole or complete links back to this section's beginning, where Jesus claims that living by his teachings will fulfill the Torah and the prophets. Next, Jesus looks at how his righteousness relates to the religious practices of his day. Now, this section has three parts. Right. In the first part, Jesus claims that living in right relationship with God and others results in a reward. But be careful, Jesus says, because if you're doing your righteousness to get public praise, then you'll miss out on the real reward that God has in store. Next, Jesus gives three examples of how religious devotion can go sideways. His examples are generosity to the poor, prayer, and fasting. In each of these, Jesus challenges his followers to express their devotion to God in subtle ways that don't attract attention. Then he completes this section by teaching about what the real reward is. Yeah, he says, don't store up for yourself treasure on the land, but store up for yourself treasure in the sky. So what is the sky treasure? Well, this idea of treasure links back to Jesus's opening claim that true righteousness brings a reward. The greatest treasure is not admiration from people, Rather, the real reward is knowing and being known by the loving God of the universe. And that leaves this third and final perspective, how doing righteousness affects our relationship with God and neighbor. Now, this section itself has three parts. First, Jesus talks about money and possessions. Why start with money? Well, our stuff tends to claim our allegiance and causes us to worry. And so our relationship to our stuff can be one of the biggest obstacles to healthy relationships with God and with other people. Jesus teaches, don't store up your stuff on the land. Rather, store up treasure in the sky. Then Jesus gives two parables. One is about two kinds of eyes you can have, a healthy, generous eye or an evil, stingy eye. The second parable focuses on two masters you can serve, God or money. Then Jesus gives a beautiful homily about worry. Why chase after security from things that are ultimately insecure? Jesus invites us to trust the generous God of creation who cares about us more than we can imagine. That's the first part. Next, Jesus directly addresses our relationship with God and neighbor. Yeah, this section begins with, do not judge others or you too will be judged. Then come two more parables, another about eyes, how you shouldn't try to remove a speck out of someone else's eye. When you have a log in your own. Then comes a parable about not tossing holy pearls to pigs and dogs. It's a riddle with multiple meanings, but essentially it's about using discernment when we try to help and correct others. Then, because relationships are so complex, Jesus encourages his disciples to ask God for the wisdom they need. Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be opened for you. This section of the Sermon on the Mount ends with the golden rule. Do to others what you want them to do to you. Jesus says that this simple teaching is what the Torah and prophets are all about. And so the golden rule concludes the third perspective on doing righteousness. And it also links us back to the opening of the main body of the sermon, where Jesus said he came to bring the Torah and prophets to their completion. Finally, we're gonna look at the last major section of the sermon the conclusion. Here, Jesus places a choice in front of his listeners about how they're going to live their lives. Now, this section has three parts. And each one illustrates this choice with a different image. The first image is about two paths with two different gates. One leads to life and the other to ruin. Second is about discerning between two kinds of leaders who claim to represent God. They're like two kinds of trees, one good and one bad. Not everyone who says they speak for God really does. But Jesus says you will know a tree by its fruit. 
The last image is about two types of houses you can build. If you ignore Jesus and build your house by your own wisdom, it's like building on sand and good luck when the storm comes. But if you listen to him and build your house with Jesus' wisdom, you are building your house on a rock. And with that, the Sermon on the Mount comes to a close. Okay, so let's review the whole sermon. It begins with the surprise announcement about how the good life of God's kingdom has come to the least likely people. And then in the main body, Jesus teaches how to do right by God and others. And finally, the conclusion calls for a decision. In light of everything Jesus has said, what choice will you make? That's a great summary. Now it's time to read and then reread and reread again the Sermon on the Mount. Our mission at Bible Project is to help people experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to Jesus. We're able to give away for free everything that we make because of generous people like you all around the world. You can see our entire video library, check out all of our resources, and join us at BibleProject.com. So, what'd you think? So as, as you've all come to know me, I love patterns in scripture, things that connect, especially within the context of a greater story. So we're introduced into these patterns of threes, right? The threes within threes. But one of the challenges we have when reading anything in scripture is prefaced by maybe this thought, right? What do I think that I already understand? You know, as I'm reading anything in the Bible, what do I think I already know, or that I think I understand, about the story I'm about to engage in? Am I viewing it or reading it for the first time? Or am I looking at it again? Because it is arguably just, it's just about impossible not to come into any text that anyone has written about anything and not have a bias about something, even when we're unaware. Okay, I do realize that's a twisted thought, and it's convoluted in a sense, so um, maybe let's see if I can add some flesh to those bones, okay? We tend to look at scriptures akin to the books we read today, the, the way books are written today. Um, you know, we even have uh, our translations of our Bibles with these same scriptures that help us, right, read it more comfortably in our context and circumstance often with our current paradigms involved. Yeah, we need to remember these are not written to us. We just need to remind ourselves that they, the authors, had an intended original audience. Because it's where they are in their time, in their location, and in their mindset that they're writing. Okay, so many times in the Dusty Feet, We've discussed chiasms, right? Or chiastic structure. And the audience, they could possibly have noticed that when they were hearing it for the first time. I'm not sure that they would have the first time, but I'm pretty sure in subsequent readings and studying that they would. So the pattern that we see in this that Tim and John are pointing out, that pattern it's a very Jewish way or Jewish mode of writing, yeah? It's the story structure that existed in Torah. So um, for those that were looking back and studying, they probably would have seen these patterns. And maybe, maybe they saw it as God's involvement in the story. You know, we realize that this type of story structure that um, we're not looking for the big ending, right? The way our, our typical, at least American-type storytellings play out, yeah? In this one, we listen to, we discuss, we ponder, we re-listen, we rediscuss, we ponder yet again. Then we start to see, and then we work our way to the center. It's the point that we're meant to, to really attach ourselves to. It's kind of like God is a teacher in a, a lecture hall, right? And he taps on the lectern or, or stomps his heel that this was a point to make note. 
chiastic structure works um it, it works like this it's but it's only seen or rather heard right through repeated listening remember that it's only seen through repeated listening or reading with us and of course here's the challenging part are we even aware that the chiastic structure exists so I think Tim and John do a fantastic job of breaking these sections down, the threes inside of threes. TheDustyFeet.com, in the Sermon on the Mount collection, there's a section called Additional Material. There, you're going to find what I'm about to show you now. And it's, um, and you can open it up, look at it. You're free to look at it later in much greater detail because it has some neat stuff to take a look in it. Um, because this graphic is really a, a chiastic structure turned on its side. So it looks like a triangle. Okay, I actually have uh, an, an observation first. I want to show you this graphic first. Because uh, typically, the chiastic structures are visualized this way, right? It's that uh, A, B, C, D, E, D, C, B, A format. And this is typically how you view it. Um, Yet I kind of like this view. This is the triangle type. And it can also be packed, again, on the inside with other related material that goes inside. It's, it's the same structure as the other one. It just turns on its side with the central focus at the peak. I kind of like this look. Um, what always interested me is the relation to the corresponding points, yeah? The points on the sides, are they mirrors, reverse mirrors, counterpoints, opposites? They can be a few things, and yet they will always relate not only to each other, but to the, to the overall central focus of the structure. Yeah? So our, our problems usually arise when we have um, particular paradigms that might hinder us from seeing certain connections that... Uh, Within that, if we miss those connections, we might miss the focus. Because who would have guessed that the focus of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer? You know, we need to remember that Matthew is a Jewish man, a disciple of Jesus, raised on Torah, at least in his youth, right? How do we know that? Because he knew of the Messiah. As a Jewish man... He's also aware of not only Jewish ways of communicating, but he's also, as we have the paradigm of belief anyways, that there's maybe as a, a, a spirit of God influence in him in his writings. Okay, so here's something that I decided to come to grips with, right? So, um because it took a bit of a paradigm shift for me. If I expect the Spirit of God influence in these authors, as I did expect of the writers in, in the Tanakh, right, the Old Testament, and that audience was the children of Israel, and the intended audience of Jesus were these same children of Israel, the lost sheep, right, and that the original audience of all the authors were these same children of Israel with Torah-based teachings, then should I not expect the same kind of communication? And within that, the patterns that they've learned to recognize. Let that sink in a bit. I'm going to say it again. If I expect a Spirit of God influence in these authors, as I did expect from the writers of the Tanakh, right, the Old Testament, and that audience was the children of Israel, and the intended audience of Jesus were these same children of Israel, these lost sheep, right, and that the original audience of all the authors were these same children of Israel, all with Torah-based teachings, then should I not expect the same communication? And within that, possibly the patterns that they've learned to recognize. Because it caused me to step back and ask a few different questions then, like, um, 
then what are they expecting? How did they view that expectation, even with Jesus? Because what made this Jewish teacher called Jesus different from the other teachers? And this pattern, this is so strongly embedded in so many parts of Scripture, both large and small chiasms. Um, so I could not, I, I couldn't help but be compelled by its validity and importance here in the Sermon on the Mount. So please, feel free to look at the chiastic triangle in, in more detail, right? It's on the dustybeat.com in the Sermon on the Mount collection in the additional materials section. You might find it compelling yourself. Who knows? Okay, secondly, I'm going to briefly, <laughs> if you believe that, I'm going to address the point that Tim and John bring up, and it's a, it's a common term we hear. We have a rather strong paradigm positions on. It's fulfillment. What might that mean? So I read an article once. Um, I wish I'd copied it, or at least the reference to it. I don't remember. It's my fault. But in that article, it mentions that the choice of the Jewish translators when working on the Septuagint, right? That's the Greek tr translation of the Tanakh, and that was accomplished many years before Jesus. That's like 300 to 100 BCE. It was those Jewish translators who decided to use the Greek word for law, nomos, for Torah. And what I heard from this Jewish author, again, I, I keep thinking it's Rabbi Foreman, he said that they probably chose the wrong word. They, those isolated teachers, that's where we get the Masoretic, Masoretes and the Masoretic text from, because they wanted to keep the children of Israel focused on the importance of these texts. But they created a problem for themselves, and they could, they could not have realized how far that that might go. Because really, a, a more accurate Hebrew translation of Torah actually is more akin to uh, instruction or, or teaching. So what I want to toss out for debate and discussion is fulfillment in relation to the Torah. And we could even address it whether you have a view of as a law, or instruction, or teaching. Because I know this thought's going to divide the room. I'm very aware of it. Yet it's still something worthy of discussion, since it will most likely have an impact on what we see as we view going forwards. Because the speaker of Matthew 5 through 7 is very much a part of this discussion. Because it's he who is and to whom he is representing. I personally believe that the response to the fulfilled question really lies with the speaker, since it really is he, not only who says it, but then he's also responsible for the actions of those that follow, right? Not only with his life example, but what he's teaching to be the example of the lives of others. So to get to fulfill. Let's talk about the passage. It's Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, um, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it's accomplished. Whoever then annuls one, uh, and is one of the least of these commandments, and teaches another to do the same, they shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches them, he shall call them great in the kingdom of heaven. Oddly enough, I'm, I'm literally, as I was writing this particular text, right, I was involved in a discussion with some guys that were focused on verse 19 alone, right? But we're going to talk about what's focused on the three verses together, 17, 18, and 19. Because it's the paradigm of not doing and then the inference of doing. So Jesus says in verse 17 that the Torah is not going away. It's not abolished. 
So how can the very next words out of his mouth infer the opposite, at least in a, in a proposed paradigm context, yeah? That fulfill will end them, affect, remove them. Because verse 18 says that nothing's going to be removed from the Torah until all has been accomplished. And, um, and we, we get that very confusing peek into the revelation given to John, yeah? along with more of Jesus' very own teachings later in Matthew and beyond. So I think that all accomplished, that is very far from being accomplished. And we, 2,000 years later, are very much a testament to that very truth. In verse 19, it seems a bit odd, at least from my reading, that if Jesus was saying that anyone that annuls when the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, and that kingdom of heaven is not fully realized yet, then how again is a reference from Jesus relevant to being fulfilled as in finished, accomplished, no longer required? done away with. So maybe, yes, maybe, maybe Jesus shows us how easy it is for us to fulfill the Torah, to live it daily, that we can live this way and be the example given Torah to the world. Okay, this is in Deuteronomy 30. Now, what I want you to remember in context Tim brought up at the end, remember? He said at the end, there was the choice, right? This is the choice. Deuteronomy 30 is the end. This is God's reference to the end of Jesus' teachings reference. This is the same point. This is the choice, right? Deuteronomy 30, starting in verse 11. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach? It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and make us to hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you should say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. See, I've set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are and entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land that you're crossing in the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life in order that you may live, and that you're, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him, for this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. So if his death was to cause Torah, these instructions, these life-giving truths, right? These, um, and they were given from his father, right? The very God that he's being loyal and obedient to, to make them now not part of our lives due to his death? You can see why I'm confused by the reference. Because there's no mention of his death being a prerequisite or an influence on this entire Sermon on the Mount. And then we come to have certain religious paradigms that infer that doing them is wrong. That has really confused me for a long time. 
I mean, a very long time. I said this in my other discussion with the guys I was having on verse 19. And this was me. I said this. I said, uh, I think at times we read it so quickly or we glance by it that it might not catch us. So I've tried with limited success to read or listen slower. <laughs> you know it's hard for me. But my point is to really try and listen. And then if I have a paradigm challenge, why might I have that paradigm challenge? And why are these verses in conflict? So, so we have a few things to ponder for a bit. We're going to ask ourselves at times, why do we have this way of belief that we have, right? What paradigms do we have? And then, and then maybe we can take some time to review them, to uh, test them, as it were. Because I have a feeling that this will happen more than once in the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus was challenging, um, he was challenging quite a bit of what they had grown to, to believe and build up over time, right? And Jesus was helping them to grow up, to take that base, that foundation of Torah, that rock, and build on it. Why? Because it was going to expand. Because from just them was going to a group much larger. One that would include us. Without the Sermon on the Mount, I am not here today, right? Well, truthfully, as are most of us. So it will be interesting as we, uh, as we move on, as we see, as we continue for the rest of the year, to see where this takes us. And the Bible Project's part two is literally just around the corner. So I'm, I'm really excited about this series, and we're going to continue covering each of them on the Dusty Feet, along with some great episodes with Jim Wern. Remember, all ten parts. And we're going to explore even more thoughts as they come up and they bring them up along their way. So remember in the description below is a link to the folks at the Bible Project and a link to the app so you can follow along and see each of the ones as they premiere and the additional topics that they discuss that we'll probably discuss. Because this should be an exciting and thought-provoking journey in the Sermon on the Mount. Because I wonder what we're going to continue to uncover. So, thanks for being with us tonight with the Sermon on the Mount, a uh, chiastic conversation, and a little bit about fulfillment on another edition of the Dusty Feet.